invite you all to find a place to sit, um, to come on in. There may be more gathering, and I've already apologized to Janie that um, even though we say starting at 9.15, that's not exactly what we're accustomed to doing. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll expect a few to trickle in and join us. Um, but uh, welcome uh, to the third part of the Richard Brogan Lecture Series. Uh, for this year, it's an annual event for us, and pleased this year that it could actually be in person, that our speakers could come and we could be with them, and such a delight and a joy for us to have Rob and Janie Sellers um, bringing messages, bringing their impressions of the church and faith in this world, and also friendships across divisions. We're thankful for that good message and thankful for Rob last night for the challenging words he brought to us, and we look forward to hearing him as he preaches um, in our worship service. A few words um, about Janie Sellers, Janie Tyler Sellers, um, is, as she would say, would want you to know, even though she lives in Texas and has lived all over the world, she is an Oklahoma gal. Uh, so make no mistake about that. She received her, um, her degree, her undergraduate degree from Oklahoma State uh, University. She's a loyal fan um, and keeps up with them. But uh, she grew up on a farm in uh, southeastern Oklahoma. And as she shared last night, her uh, father gave her a, a camera and said, take pictures wherever you go, bring them back, and tell us the stories. And that's what she's been doing uh, for most of her life. Some of you had an opportunity to see the ones here on the chancel, and there are about 31 more over in our fellowship hall. And uh, so you can have time <clears throat> after Janie shares her faith story. I think she'll stop a few minutes early and then you can walk over there with her. And if you have questions, um, you'll have an opportunity to do that. And also she has graciously allowed us to keep them uh, for the next month or so uh, until I can work out a time to meet her and <laughs> get them back to her. But uh, a wonderful, uh, gift to us to be able to look at them, to really study them and think about them. So um, I, I know you've been impressed with these and there's even more to enjoy. Um, I, Rob and Janie, I think I shared last night, have been friends of ours for oh many years, since seminary days when John and Rob were working on their uh, graduate degrees at Southern Seminary. And uh, they have been faithful friends, sharing prayer requests, uh, needs, concerns about our children and our lives and have always um, been very, very supportive. They are unique and wonderful friends and we've benefited greatly uh, from that friendship and um, are thankful for them and the, their gifts to us in our lives. So, Janie, come and share your faith story and we look forward to it. Thank you so much for the time to come and be with you. Um, our friendship with John and Susan, I promise, is just as precious to us as it is to them. <laughs> and we take every opportunity we have passing through driving east and west on I-20 to stop and, and visit with them. Imagine, if you will, a hot summer morning on a farm in eastern Oklahoma the rolling hills, we call them mountains, but they're really rolling hills. Five little girls, ages five, six, seven, eight, and nine, <laughs> getting dressed for the summer day. Not for camp, not with swimsuits on, ready to go jump in the pool, but on a farm, our day began in long jeans, long sleeve shirts, work boots and hats to protect us from the sun, headed to the field to pick green beans. Strapped over our shoulders was an old feed sack that mom sewed a strap on and hooked it around our shoulders to have a place to pick those beans as we crawled on our knees down the rows. Green beans or purple hull peas, later in the season we would be picking cotton or, or um, pulling sweet corn 
or any one of a number of other activities on a summer day. But sometimes um, Daddy would come pick us up after a few hours in the field and drive us around the corner to the watermelon patch. He would choose just the right one and he would pick it up and drop it just hard enough to pop it open. And we would dig in, grubby hands and all, picking all those beans, all that dirt. We just dug into that watermelon. Watermelon has never tasted so good. Later in the summer, um, sometimes if there was an opportunity and if mom had time, we would put on our swimsuits and go jump in the blue hole. That's what we called our little, our little swimming hole um, along, along a river. So um, in the fall, we walked a mile and a half to school every day. And it didn't matter what the weather was like on May 1. Mom always made us wait till May 1 to go barefoot. So it didn't matter how hot that road was and how, how cold or hot it was, but we went barefoot because that was, that was another treat. Um, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and every night of a revival, we were in church, drove the seven miles in the town to the First Baptist Church of Kyoto. Tiny little church, as long as I can remember. Daddy was the Sunday school superintendent and a deacon, of course, and mom was the choir director and a Sunday school teacher and a training union teacher. Anybody remember training union? <laughs> oh, I see lots of heads nodding. Okay, um, my parents were just those salt of the earth kind of folks, deeply devoted to God and to their faith and to pouring that faith into the lives of their five daughters. I'm the oldest, so I always kind of had to be in charge a little bit, um, but it was really a wonderful life. And the verse that I'm sure is a favorite to many of you that has always guided my life is Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 or 14, however far you want to go. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then I, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. And I have continued throughout my life to find God everywhere I went and to learn a little bit more about who God is along the way because of the marvelous example of my parents. Uh, Susan just reminded, reminded you um, of uh, the story that I tell about uh, my parents giving me a camera on my 13th birthday. And I don't know why I remember this so well, but as Daddy handed me um, the camera, and they didn't wrap it, they just handed me the camera, said happy birthday. Had two other birthdays that month, so that was kind of special to get, to get a camera, and nobody else did. <laughs> but um, handed me that camera, and he said, take this camera with you to all the places where you go and all the people that you meet and take pictures and bring them back home and tell us your stories. Well, I'm still telling stories, so I want to share a few stories with you this morning. Um, went into high school in Kyoto and to Kyoto for high school during those high school years, lots of activities, 4-H club trips and tours, and Daddy wanted to make sure we all had a chance to to make a trip overseas. So 4-H club trips in the summertime to Europe um, were an exciting adventure for each one of us just once. And, uh, and they, that was one of the ways they wanted to open our, open our lives to the world. Graduated from high school, took off for Oklahoma State University, and those were the real growth spurt years for me spiritually. 
because of the ministry of the Baptist Student Union. I was so thankful that right across the street from my dorm was the Baptist Student Union, and I went to college all by myself. I didn't know anybody else who was going there, came from this tiny little town, from this farm, and I didn't know anybody there. So when I walked across the street, I just happened to notice notice the sign that said Baptist Student Union. When, when I walked into those doors, I was walking into the, one of the most exciting adventures of my life. That's where I began to learn more about spiritual growth and listening to speakers and exchanging ideas and thoughts with my friends that I developed there. It was truly an exciting four years. And then graduation was approaching. During my senior year, I heard about the journeyman program, the missionary journeyman program through the Foreign Mission Board. And I checked that out and applied and was accepted and was assigned initially to go to Indonesia. But when I got to journeyman training and we, well, there were three other girls going to Indonesia and we were all so excited. We studied Indonesian all summer long and were preparing to go to Indonesia. But um, visas for missionaries to Indonesia have always been a problem. So I had to wait. The other three were all going to teach. So they were able to get their visas through the Department of Education and the Indonesian government. And they really liked teachers. But I was going to be a student minister to work with college students in, in Indonesia. So that visa had to come through the Department of Religion and they didn't want more missionaries. So uh, it took a while and I waited and I waited. And one day, Keith Parks, who was president of the Foreign Mission Board at the time, met me in the hallway. I was working at the Foreign Mission Board offices while I waited for that visa. Keith met me in the hallway and he said, Janie, I think we're wasting your time sitting here in Richmond, and I have an urgent request for, from Cali, Colombia, for someone to work with students, and I think the job would fit you perfectly. So tears began to stream down my cheeks because I'd been counting on and planning on going to Indonesia for several months. But that course got changed and I am so thankful for the two years that I spent in Cali, Colombia. During those years of uh, ministry to students, I got to know MKs, I learned the term MK, which stands for missionary kid, and got to know those MKs and uh, truly reveled in the time I was able to spend with them. So I headed back to the States at the end of that two years, again with tears in my eyes from leaving Colombia, and uh, headed back to America, and went to Glorietta for our group's debriefing. And while there, a friend of, one of my friends who had gone to Indonesia as a journeyman introduced me to another person who had been a journeyman in Indonesia, and his name was Rob Sellers. So she introduced us that night, and that was kind of it for both of us. We both, we both just kind of thought, okay. Of course, we didn't share that with one another, but we went back to went back home and told our friends. And um, <laughs> one a, a friend back in Stillwater actually had had met Rob a few years earlier on his way to Indonesia as a journeyman. She had met him on an airplane, so that was an interesting connection. Those connections have been absolutely thrilling. I've always known that God had a plan for my life, and all along the way, bumps or mountains or valleys or whatever happened, I've always knew, known that God was listening when I prayed. And I have continued to find God in the process. I didn't realize, I don't think, until I came back 
from those two years in Columbia. I had never slowed down long enough. I tend to keep on moving and do lots of stuff and never stop, never stop along the way to, to uh, ponder the reasons. But I realized in looking back how my history and my preparation had guided me in this very direction. So I looked back and I remembered in high school uh, during, during the summertime, in addition to working in the fields, we also would, the, a team from, from our church, which was the biggest one anywhere in the area, uh, went around and helped lead, a bunch of the young people helped lead vacation Bible schools in smaller churches in our area. And then at Oklahoma State, because of BSU ministries, there were lots of, lots of mission outreach programs. And I happened to be chosen as the missions chairman for our, our BSU. So I had lots of opportunities to be summer missionary in Michigan and then another summer in Portland, Oregon and out on the coast of Oregon. So lots of mission experiences along the way, which to me were just a part of my life. But as I looked back and on that time as a journeyman, I realized and when I met Rob at Glorietta, one of the first questions he asked me was, well, do you think you might ever want to go back overseas as a missionary? I'd never even thought about that, about missions as a career. But when he asked me that question, the words just kind of poured out of my mouth and I said, oh yes, that's what I want to do. And I honestly hadn't even realized it until then, but that was a part of the process of God's call in my life to identify those things that um, were preparing me for a life of service and missions. So let's look for a few minutes at um, a section of verses in Mark 6. I'm going to read. Mark 6, verses 45 through 51. And this is about Jesus walking on the water. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. They had been hanging out together and doing lots of stuff. But they went to, went to the, the lake, and Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead. They were going to cross over to Bethsaida. So he told the guys to get in the boat and go on ahead. He needed a little bit of quiet time. Don't we all need that? And so he dismissed the crowd, and after leaving the disciples and all the crowd, he went up on a mountainside to pray. I often go to the hills to pray, even if I'm going to the hills in my heart. Uh, I imagine our home in Oklahoma on top of a mountain, and it's one of the most peaceful places on earth for me to pray. So I just go there in my mind. Okay, back to verse 47. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. He didn't go immediately. He saw them struggling, and he waited until the fourth watch and decided, okay, now it's time to go rescue them. So he took off. He didn't have a boat, so he just walked on the water. Don't you think that was fun for Jesus? He was always so surrounded by people and always teaching and always healing and always giving. Don't you just imagine Jesus kind of skipping across the water just because he could? <laughs> I've always enjoyed reading this story and um, thinking about Jesus walking on the water and thinking how much fun <laughs> that would be. So he went out walking on the water, and he was about to pass by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. So they cried out because they all saw him, and they were scared to death. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. So he climbed into the boat with them, 
and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. I've always been amazed in looking back at my life at how God just appears at just the right time. Never early, even though I always wanted, and probably most of us want to know what's coming, what's ahead. Lord, what is it that's down the road? How should I organize my life <laughs> to be ready for whatever's next? But my experience has been God never tells me what's going to happen ahead, but just prepares me. Sometimes the waiting is miserable, isn't it? So Jesus saw the disciples struggling, and lots of times Jesus sees us struggling, I know. But he was walking on the water to calm it. So he saw them struggling, and he walked on the water and calmed the storm even though they were with him, they had suddenly, they'd been with him for a long time, but just suddenly they realized who he really was. Sometimes, don't you get really frustrated with the disciples for being so thick-headed? They just didn't realize who was walking with them. Of course, I've never done that, have you? We just don't realize how present God always is with them. The disciples tended to be a bit oblivious to God's work and the significance of his presence among them. Now, suddenly, they recognized his power. And Jesus was so thrilled that he gave up on his time alone and climbed into the boat with them. They were amazed. Sometimes God wants to take care of us quietly. And more often than not, that's how God comes to me. So during those years, after uh, returning from all of those, of, of those adventures, uh, which, which I finally looked back and realized were all God's preparation for me, I recognized the times when God had had to pick me up and carry me through some of those times. You know the famous poem, Footprints, how there are two sets of footprints walking in the sand, and then suddenly there's just one set of footprints. And the question at the end was, God, where were you during those most difficult times of my life? I was carrying you. Those were my footprints because I was carrying you. So we... Uh, when Rob and I met, um, I was a youth minister at a church in Oklahoma, and he was in seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And we visited back and forth a few times, and the following summer after, after, after meeting him. And then I also was invited to come back to the Foreign Mission Board and work as assistant director of the journeyman program and do all the traveling and speaking for the journeyman program. So. I occasionally had a chance to fly through Louisville, Kentucky also as I was traveling all over the United States to speak. But uh, Rob and I had a few times to be together. And then the summer of 1972, we were married. Uh, what a happy day that was. And uh, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, a place that was new to both of us. And uh, Rob served as youth minister at a church in Charlotte, and I was BSU director at uh, campus at UNCC in, in Charlotte, University of North Carolina in Charlotte, and also was teaching English to foreign students. So that kept up that, that interest in and delight in international students, because I was teaching English to students from all over the world. But I kept being reminded of God's leadership in my life and how that was exactly where I was supposed to be. There were bumps in the road always, but after three years, uh, Rob and I were appointed by the Foreign Mission Board to go as missionaries to Indonesia. When I didn't get a visa as a journeyman to go to Indonesia and was reassigned 
to South America, I promised myself, I said, someday, somehow, some way, I'm going to Indonesia. <laughs> well, I didn't know how that was going to happen, but sure enough, it did. And on our third wedding anniversary, actually, we were appointed as missionaries by the Foreign Mission Board to go to Indonesia, and finally I was going to get to go. So we went to Indonesia to um, spend the first year, of course, in language school, and that was an exciting experience. Learning a new language is not fun for everybody, but it was fun for me, and I really enjoyed it. So we spent a year in language study and began to work again with MKs in Indonesia. So getting to know those young people and walking with them through some of the struggles that they experienced. We worked mostly with high school age MKs who had come from all over the country uh, where their families were serving to go to high school in Jakarta. And they all lived in an MK dormitory in Jakarta. And we lived not too far from that dormitory and spent lots of time with those MKs, those missionary kids, in discipleship and uh, just being with them. One of my main uh, desires during those years and one of the tools that I used the most was discipleship training. So Rob and I sort of put together a, a discipleship program that, that was designed especially for young people. And I had the incredible privilege of discipling 25 young MK women uh, during those years while they were in high school, during our years in Jakarta. I also had opportunity to disciple Indonesian young women through our church in Jakarta. So discipleship was, was my calling during those years of working with young people. We had many opportunities to travel and to work with folks in Indonesia, leaders in the church, Indonesian leaders in the church who wanted to learn how to work with young people. So we planned lots of retreats for churches all over the island of Java and had, had a wonderful experience in teaching them how to work with young people. And then our first baby came along and I slowed down a little bit, but I still was able to invite a group of young women to my home and was able to be mom and, and continue that discipleship ministry with both Indonesian and MK young women. So those were thrilling, thrilling times for me to do that. During the years, and if you were here last night, you heard Rob talking about some frustrating years uh, on the mission field when our calling wasn't what someone else expected of us. But because of God's grace and goodness and because of the strength of God's calling in our lives, we knew we were doing the right thing. We chose to spend time with our children and make sure they knew, sort of discipling our children, if you will, along the way. Make sure they knew that they were the most important people there for us. Sometimes when we um, hit brick walls, we wonder why in the world is this happening? And that happened to us when we uh, came home on a furlough. Well, another furlough, we, we came home and studied. Rob was able to finish his PhD at Southern Seminary. And during that same time, I finished my master's degree uh, at the seminary. And those were busy and hectic years. And we went back to Indonesia and both of us, the, the mission then chose to move us from Jakarta, the big city of Jakarta, to Samadang, a smaller city on the northern. There were about 13 million people in Jakarta then. I think they're probably up to about 15 million now. But we moved to a small town of Samadang, which only had a million people. <laughs> it was on the north coast of Java, but we loved teaching at the seminary. We loved being involved in the lives of those seminary students. And it was so exciting to teach them 
I also was homeschooling our children. They, when we were in Jakarta, they were able to go to Jakarta International School, but when we moved to Samarang, um, I was called upon to teach my children, which I, I asked God a long time before that, please not ever to ask me to do that. But, but then I did anyway, <laughs> knowing full well the verses in Jeremiah that continue, continued to promise me that God was there with me and would always be with me and would always be my strength. When we lost our visas to Indonesia, that, I believe, was the most difficult thing I had ever done up until that time, was to leave Indonesia. And we just knew that that was our calling. But we came back to the States, and there are lots more stories involved there, which I, I don't have time to share with you, but our children's acceptance of that was really important to us. They were both born in Indonesia. Our son Tyler and our daughter Marnie were Indonesian MKs, and they were devastated when we lost our visas. It didn't happen until college time for them. People used to ask me when the kids were little, Janie, what are you gonna do uh, when your kids go off to college? And I would just, would just laugh and shrug my shoulders and say, I'm going with them. That was certainly not our intention, and we had made plans for the, to send them back to America, like all missionaries do, send them back to America to go to college. But Tyler's spring of his senior year, uh, or his junior year in high school, was when we began to realize that we were not going to be able to get our visas renewed because the government was just shutting down uh, visas for missionaries. But I, I believe that was God's plan all along because for Tyler's senior year in high school and Marnie's junior year, we had had to come back to the States uh, and therefore were able to be closer to them when they started college and during those college years. So there are just many blessings along the way that keep reminding me to this day that God is always present. And we don't always know what God's plans are for the future, but we have always been confident. Always, God wants us to recognize the power that surrounds us. But often we don't see the big and little things that God is doing for us. Just like those disciples who were with him all the time but didn't really recognize it. And then sometimes they saw it and then forgot it. But the disciples, I believe, finally woke up. It took them a long time, but they finally woke up. So what I feel like we need to do is wake up and see what God is doing for us. Recognize the presence of Jesus the hands of Jesus, the calmness and gentleness of Jesus as he walks with us. So look around you. See what God is doing for you. And be grateful. So what's happening to you right now? What struggles are you experiencing? How has God been present with you? Did you recognize it when that presence came to you? Sometimes without us even asking. When young people come to me and ask, what do I do? I've prayed and I've prayed, and I, God's not telling me anything. I've always said, you Listen for God's voice and all the things that you're doing. And maybe, just maybe, God has something else to teach us in the process during those difficult times. So listen, really listen, like God listens to us, and figure out what it is 
that God wants you to learn before revealing to you what the next step is. That's been my experience. So maybe God's trying to do something for you or with you. Maybe it's something that you need to do for someone else and learn in the process. And we just don't get it. We don't recognize it. So open your eyes. Open your hearts. Recognize God's action in your life. And be amazed. Always amazed. Okay. I've shared a little bit of background for you. So I would like for us all to go over. Oh, is it about... Yeah, we're, we're right on time. So let's just, I'm going to say a closing prayer, and then we'll all walk over together to the fellowship hall and take a look at some of the reminders. I'm still taking pictures, and I'm still telling the stories. So tell your story. Write some of them down, because you might forget, and be amazed at God's action in your life. With all our hearts, dear God, we lift praise and honor and glory to you. As you surround us constantly with your presence, help us to open our eyes and open our hearts and open our hands or reach out our hands to help someone else around us. Speak to us and help us to hear it. Listen to us and help us clear those frustrations from our hearts and minds. Give us grace to hear and to do in your way. Forgive us for the times when we fail to recognize who you are and how close you are to us and walk with us in everything we say and do. In the strong name of Jesus, who walked on water, we pray, amen. Okay, let's take a little stroll, give ourselves a break, and go that way and see pictures. Anything else, Susan, before we?